Uh, what I'll be doing today is a review of one of my favorite Bibles, the Cambridge Interlinear Bible, which includes the text for both the King James Version of 1611 and the Revised Version of 1885. Here's the box, and here are the ISBN, or here is the ISBN. Gives you both the 10 digit and the 13 digit. It is a goatskin Bible. And here it is. It's a nice fine grain. It says goatskin leather down below. I know corner aficionados like to look at corners. The goatskin's very thin, so I don't think the corner was much of a challenge. The liner appears to be a synthetic. You can see the fine grain in the goatskin here. And the name of it is the Interlinear Bible. It has the King James Version and the Revised Version. Actually, you'll notice later on that the Revised Version comes first and the King James Version comes later. So perhaps they should have named it the other way around. Back of the book. Then it uh, has Art Guild edges and a very nice salmon color. But you'll see sort of, it looks like buff marks through there. And then on the long edge, if I can hold it the right way, you can see that it's really in two colors. Uh, up here is sort of a lighter red, then down here is darker. I don't know if that was done deliberately or if that's a manufacturing problem, but I think it's kind of unique. It gives the book character. You may also be able to see uh, there are ridges here. I think the paper was cut unevenly. So if I hold the camera right, you might actually be able to see kind of a tiny mountain range along the edge of the book. I noticed those when I got it. They didn't affect the usability of the book, so I decided not to send it back. I have several end sheets. You have a ribbon marker. It's three-eighths of an inch in black, um, but it has kind of a ragged edge to it. I tend not to use ribbon markers and tuck them away inside the book anyway. Uh, after the ribbon markers, title page, Another title page, Cambridge University Press. Uh, and it tells you here that it has the authorized version, the revised version, and the variant readings from the American Standard Version. I'll show you some of those as well. Marginal notes of both versions. Those are the text notes. Central references. The central references are from the revised version. I think those were actually finalized in 1893. Go to the next page copyright page and it tells you that it's printed in Great Britain at the University Press Cambridge. I don't know that they do that anymore. Uh, an intro to the interlinear Bible, preface to the edition with marginal notes, and then here's the title page to the Bible and they show you on this title page that these are the words that were in the authorized version, so what's prefaced by AV is the authorized version variant. And down here, these are the, the words that appear in the same place in the revised version. So where the authorized version says, and with the former translations diligently compared, etc., the revised version said, being the version set forth AD 1611, etc. A preface of the revisers to the Old Testament. The Old Testament came out in 1885, the New Testament in 1881. So this preface is actually kind of a, an addendum to the preface that comes right before the New Testament. That's the preface to the 1881 New Testament. Table of contents, names and orders of all the books in the New Testament, and then we come to the first book of Moses, and you'll see the revised version says commonly called Genesis, and the authorized version says called Genesis. Revised version comes above the authorized version, and so in the text. So if we look here at Genesis 1-2, and the earth was waste and void, is the revised version reading. And the earth was without form and void, as everyone remembers, is the King James Version reading. So let me tell you a little bit about the book. Get rid of the box put my stand in place 
And let's talk about some features of this book. The um, book itself is nine and five eighths inches tall, seven and a half inches wide, one and three quarters inches thick. At its narrow spot, it varies, but here it's one and three quarters. Here at the spine, it's about two inches thick. Get back to where we were. Um, those are the dimensions. The page dimensions on the inside, it, the pages are top to bottom, 227 millimeters. I switched to metric because I can measure that more accurately with my ruler. And 133 wide. The uh, margins of the page at the top, above the black line at the top, they are, it's 22 millimeters. 31 millimeters down here at the bottom below that line, which you have to share with the text notes. The inner margin is 25, so that's about an inch, and the outer margin is 27 millimeters. So you have quite a lot of room all around. Um, one of the th neat things that that inner margin does for you is allows the page to lie very flat which is a nice thing for those of us with older eyes who are wearing uh, magnifying uh, lenses in our glasses and they tend to make the depth of focus quite shallow. Those are the margins, page dimensions, um, columns. Two columns as you can see. They are nice and narrow, although the font's quite large. It's a narrow column. It is about 33 characters wide. The font here is roughly the equivalent of a Georgia 9.5. It's a little bit larger, somewhere between a 9.5 and a 10. It's very close. The interlinear font, which is this here, we'll zoom in just a bit for a second. You can see that. That interlinear font, if I wanted to read the revised version, this verse would read, For unto thee will I give it. Those look uh, right at about six points as a Georgia equivalent. So it's quite small. You have essentially a 9.5 point font and then with two six point fonts wedged in. All right, so what else do I need to point out here? Um, as you see, you have at the top of the page in the center the book title, and then rather than having any kind of running headings at all, you have just like in a dictionary, you have the, the place where the, the first words on the page come from, so it's chapter 39 verse 5 here in Exodus, and the page runs through chapter 39 verse 27, but nothing in terms of what's on the page itself, nothing about the content. Um, the book is Smythe's own. It does lie flat. I think that's pretty easy to see that it would. With absolutely no problem there. Um, center column references you can see. Center column references are easy to use. They run from the top of the page down and they are without regard to which column. So the A for which Numbers 1131 refers is the first one. As you come down the page you find here a B and then you find B and so the uh, the beginning of the reference set is inset. It's uh, an indented system. So C here is indented, D is indented and you can generally find them quite easily just by looking for the indentation. Come back out again. Where do I want to go next? Well, let's see, I've told you about the font. I told you about the font size. Uh, while we're looking at a piece of paper, the um, paper thickness here is measured to be about 34 micrometers. So it's quite uh, thin paper. It is also sometimes hard to turn it's just a single page. 
doing it quite easily right now, but sometimes it's not that easy, and I think it's a combination of the fact that the paper is very thin and it's very long, so it's sometimes hard, hard to turn the pages. The paper weight, I estimate at 31 GSM. So you have after after the Old Testament in the book, flip on forward, and after at the end of Malachi, you have an appendix. This is uh, the um, the recommendations of the American Committee. Uh, changes which they recommended be included in the revised version, which were not. And, but the American Committee in 1901 published their own American Standard Version, so these are the kinds of changes that came in there. I'll zoom in a little bit so that you can see some of those. And this sort of distinguishes the revised version from the American Standard Version. The American Standard Version substitutes um, for the Lord, a guess at the divine name, Jehovah, that was the 19th century German guess, as opposed to the 20th century guess of Yahweh. So the American Standard Version has Jehovah, where the Revised Version more happily has the Lord. Um, the American Standard Version substitutes Sheol for the grave, pit, or hell, and all those places. The American Standard Version doesn't like to use thine before hand, for instance. They use thy before hand, whereas your King James Version and the more conservative 1885 um, revised version both use thine. Those are the kinds of differences. And it goes on for several pages. After those, you get to the New Testament. And I just want to show here. This gives you a sense for the amount of show through. The paper is really very opaque for being so thin. And I have no, because the font is so nice and dark, I have no problems with that at all. No show through issues. Here we go to the first preface. This is the preface that was published in 1881. And I just, as I go through here to point out something, um, I see on the internet from time to time people making the claim, the statement, that the uh, revised version translators had no charter to change the text of the revised version. Um, but if you look here, the principles and rules agreed to by the committee um, of convocation. Convocation is kind of like a parliament of the Church of England. On the 25th day of May 1870, and if you read the fourth one, it says that the text to be adopted be that for which the evidence is decidedly preponderating. And then, so that's the text. What am I translating? And if you go over here to the translator's own paragraph, their own interpretation of that paragraph, they say, In regard to the readings thus approved, it may be observed that the fourth rule, by requiring that the text to be adopted should be that for which the evidence is decidedly preponderating, was in effect an instruction to follow the authority of documentary ev evidence. So uh, they thought they had a charter to take them uh, to whichever text they thought uh, had the most evidence behind it. Here we are in the New Testament. I think you'll notice that in the New Testament, the number of changes per line increases quite a lot. There are more changes um, per page in the New Testament than there were in the Old Testament. I love this dark font. I love this dark, old-style font. I wish, uh, personally, that I had simply the Revised Version and not both the Revised Version and the King James Version. It's not because I don't like the King James Version, but I have plenty of copies of the King James Version. I don't have a good, clean copy of the Revised Version. I certainly would like that. After the... Oh, another thing I want to point out. No red letters. This is wonderful. I can read this with ease. None of those painful pink letters burning into my eyes. 
after the New Testament, in this book, see I'm having a little difficulty turning pages here, you come to the changes that the American Revisers suggested in the New Testament, which were not taken up by the Revised Version Committee. So, for instance, uh, in the book titles, they said strike out saint from the title of the Gospels and from the headings of the pages. Um, they don't like Holy Ghost. They prefer Holy Spirit. Um, where the King James Version and the Revised Version say tempt, they prefer try or make trial of, wherever enticement to what is wrong is not evidently spoken of. All in all, the philosophy of the American Committee was more progressive than that of the English Committee. After that, you have a um, schedule for reading your Bible through in a year. You have an index to notes. So this is um, a number of pages, 12 pages, six sheets of page, paper with index to notes. And then after that, you have 32 sheets or 64 pages of nice, thick, lined paper. After the lined paper, you have an index to maps. And those of you with quick eyes may have noticed an interesting curiosity here. This is an index to maps published by Oxford University Press. Arch enemies of Cambridge, but Cambridge used the Oxford maps. And I have my two final ribbon markers tucked away here at the back of the boat. So that's a quick fly-through of a very nice Bible. It's the Cambridge Interlinear Bible. I'm just going to look at my notes here to see if I've forgotten to tell you anything. Uh, we talked about uh, just about everything here on my note page. So let me talk about what I dislike about it. I I like the font. I love the fact that I can have the revised version text, uh, even though I would prefer to have the revised version text in larger font where it differs from the authorized version. The paper is a bit too thin and too wide. I guess what I would like to do is to increase the paper weight or the paper thickness. I love the fact that the, uh, the page is really very flat through here where I'm reading it. It has nice margins. If you wanted to write in the margins, you could. But um, it needs to be a little heavier. That way you can follow along with people a little bit more eas easily when they say, uh, go to uh, uh, back of 214 or whatever. You can flip there more quickly than you can with this book. Um, I think the book titles would be better served being at the outer edge. That would help you navigate through your Bible a little bit more quickly. Um, because it's in goat skin, it's kind of expensive. They could replace the goat skin with some other animal hide that's just as flexible or more flexible, such as uh, top grain leather. Um, here, you have the revised version text notes at the bottom of the page. I think it would be better if they put those in the margin along the side of the points where those textual issues are addressed. That would be more convenient. So um, that's about it for the overview of the Bible and the major part of the review. What I'm going to do now is turn off the camera and set up a few comparisons where there are just interesting things about the translation that I'd like to talk about. Okay, um, I do want to do a font comparison. So I have here on the right my uh, Allen 53 long primer and to the left of it is the Cambridge Interlinear Bible. So here we are at verse 5 on the left and Abram took Sarai his wife, and Abram took Sarai his wife. So you can see them side by side fairly well there. They're roughly the same size. The uh, 
long primer font is a little more pleasing to the eye, but they're nice, both nice and dark and bold and large and easy to read. I like them both. Now we are in the book of Romans. This is the 8th chapter, the 34th verse is what I'm looking at. And I just wanted to point out here that where the revised version says, it is Christ Jesus that died, yea, rather, that was raised from the dead, where the King James Version said, is risen again, and does not include from the dead. Uh, the revised version, uh, the revised version translators thought they were on good textual grounds by adding in from the dead based on the discoveries in the 19th century of ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Well, we've made more discoveries since then, and our more modern translations tend to, in this case, go back. I'll show you here Romans 9.34 from the English Standard Version who indeed is interceding for us. Let's see. A little above that, more than that, who was raised. So it just says, who was raised, like the King James Version, and not raised from the dead, like the Revised Version. We're still in the Book of Romans. This is verse 19 of chapter 15, where the revised version based on its recent discoveries of Greek texts said in the power of the Holy Ghost while the King James Version said by the power of the Spirit of God and I'm going to show you as you might suspect the English Standard Version says by the power of the Spirit of God in agreement with the old Textus Receptus As a third example of the same sort of phenomenon, here in 1 Peter 1.22, the Revised Version says, Love one another from the heart fervently. They do not include pure. The King James Version says, Love one another with a pure heart fervently. And as by now I'm sure you can predict, the English Standard Version agrees with the King James Version in this instance. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So that's about it. Um, I do notice that one thing that I forgot to mention in the overview video was that I uh, forgot to say anything about the concordance. Uh, that was easy to do because there is no concordance in this book. So there you have it. Um, Cambridge in a Linear Bible. It's one of my favorites. I really like this book. And uh, if you can find it, it might be a very useful tool to you.